a pleasure to be here. Um, academics and the use of all of our talents at a place like CRS are critical to put these things together. And so it's very exciting to be part of um, the learning process that we will all enter into in, the, in this next couple of years as you begin to, to get much more familiar with what CRS is doing and how we go about doing that. And I've been tasked this morning with giving you just a brief overview of what uh, that framework that we call integral human development looks like. As Chris just pointed out, um, the, how we arrived at the point of the justice lens. And then the next step, obviously, is how are we going to actually implement so basically what I'd like to do is just to go through a few examples of things that actually show us that process, how we go about doing that. Now if I can figure out the technology. Um, we, we realized that it was really within CRS that we needed to find out how to do this. We needed to have an agency-wide framework that would show us how to really take that justice lens and put it into practice in our programming. So that was the first step. So we needed that framework, and many people within CRS were involved in framing that. And it was framed about 2002, 2003, and it really has two components. It has a goal. In other words, it's a, con a conceptual framework, and that framework really is promoting the good of every person. We'll see and understand a bit more about where it comes from specifically, but it's also a process, and that process is the framework that will actually take and put pieces together to show that our programming really responds to something that's very, very new and different for CRS. So where does it come from? It comes from our, our experience with Catholic social teaching from the encyclicals, and that's what, where we gain our need to take this process forward and operationalize it as that justice lens that, that Chris was talking about. Um, it's, a, it's a concept that's universal, it's holistic, it looks for sustainable results, and so we're looking to find that as it moves forward, we, we know that sim our similar counterparts and partners out in the world, like CARE, like DFID, like some of the development agencies, all have these kinds of frameworks, and CRS was in need of putting that together as well. So where does it begin? Um, this is a group of actually Muslim women with whom I spent uh, a couple weeks in the last, um, the last couple weeks in Ethiopia who have been very much a part of the kind of programming that CRS is about. Um, it's interesting to see that when we talk about a commitment to a justice lens, really what does that mean? And actually this statement by Pope John, even though it may have been said a long, long time ago, has special rel relevance right now because we are seeing that the link to the economic resources, to the political systems that we're about as we work with local governments to do this work better, that we need to actually find new ways to, to work in a world that's dynamically changing right now. And so that's a challenge that's put before us within CRS. So here's this, the framework. Um, what does it mean? Um, we have a series of different points on it that, that are critical, and really the one that we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about today is the issue of assets, because assets look at all six aspects, the spiritual, the social, political, financial, natural, and physical. And I just came from an area where the physical and the natural uh, have extremely um, influenced what CRS needs to be doing in a context like a drought-stricken Ethiopia. And so there's all of those pieces that need to go into it. On this side, the critical elements are our ability to, to challenge, to look at stru structures and systems, things that really make a difference in people's lives, be they legal, be they political, be they, be they areas where our religious values and systems enter into this whole process. And so this, the, the, the framework has multiple components. We work through strategies. And if you look and you'll see some of the materials in the, the PQSD, our sector uh, areas have developed, we have put together strategies using this framework for health, for HIV, for peace building, for water, 
for all of our sectors in an effort to really reach a point where the outcomes are that relationship to sustainable development that CRS is committed to. So that's in a, in, a, in a nutshell what that framework looks like. Why is it that we need this? Why do we use a, an IHD framework? It really does look at the issues of human dignity, where we've come from in terms of our Catholic social teaching. It links to values, and we, we approach it from a strength relationship. In other words, it isn't what people don't have in these communities we work in. It's what they do have, what their assets are, what their strengths are, what the opportunities are that we can build into. It looks at power issues and the imbalances of that power and the structural injustices when we look at systems that, that impact the lives of the participants and the beneficiaries that we work with. And so all of these things really are what the IHD framework helps us figure out as we design and implement programming. So, so how does it work? It, we really use it very concretely right from the pr proposal development stage, the project design, down through the implementation, the evaluation, and the ability, hopefully, each time that what we've left behind is sustainable and our programs and projects continue on. So these are the, the, some of the issues that we'll look at in terms of how it actually um, plays out. CRS has a whole strategy around um, training using the IHD framework. Um, you, I think, all got to see some of the materials in advance that, um, that describe some of the details. So, so here are the questions that I think we, as we go through this, need to be thinking about. How can that, the framework build on people's strengths and opportunities? When you see an area of drought-stricken Ethiopia, for example, there is no water. It hasn't rained. Rain is now three and a half months behind. There is no agriculture. People eat only six to seven months max of the year. How do we respond and how can we look at that situation in terms of a positive, what are the assets they do have and how can we in fact make a difference in that kind of an environment? The next one is really how can we then decide what appropriate uh, interventions should look like? When we're talking about a drought-stricken region, we have expertise in here in CRS with people who know what we mean by, quotes, dry agriculture. Anyone ever heard of that? I had never heard of what we meant by dry agriculture. But in fact, there are some strategies around that that can be applied in that kind of an environment. And then thirdly, looking at how we, a very important mandate that we all have and work towards every day is building the strengths, the skills, and the capabilities of our CRS staff and our partners in the field who are actually those who implement. So those are the things to just be thinking about as, as we look at, at, at the process. The other element that more and more every day CRS has begun to take much more seriously and put front and center is the issue of gender and how that links into the IHD framework. So really what we've needed here is to begin to think to very concretely in our programming about how we can address those gender inequalities. And they come out, if you look at the framework, you'll see if we're going to respond to structures and systems, clearly there's issues of power, there's issues of roles and relationships between men and women, uh, adolescent girls, what, what kind of a, of a situation do we find them in if we're beginning to try to put together programmings that would respond to issues around female genital cutting, on abduction, on child marriage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those are really critical issues. So, so therefore, it's important, and it comes out of our mission and our vision. It's relevant, and it's effective when we begin to look at some of the results that we're, we're working towards within our programming, that is, taking into account gender. We're also seeing that as those imbalances of power in those relationships, uh, we also have to be extremely careful that we're doing no harm, because as we talk about um, some of the critical issues CRS is beginning to see in terms of, for example, gender-based violence. There's a lot of, of areas where we have to be extremely sensitive and careful when we, when we enter into issues that, that impact that. 
So, so why do we do it? Why, do we, why are we putting all of this together? Um, it's because we really are called to work towards right relationship. Because women are living in serious and extreme situations of injustice and inequality. And because we know that it works. We know that when we do take into account gender in relationship to our framework, which is our strategy overall, we know that it's really the right thing to do. We also know that the timing is correct. Uh, many of our donors right now in CRS are actually demanding from us, where is your expertise? How do you, where is your gender strategy? How does it link to your program framework? And so we, we've been put on, we've, the call is, is f put forward now, and so we're, be we're beginning to find new ways to respond to that. So how do we do that? This is some very quick examples. We have to use that framework to look specifically at structures. We have been doing, I just came from doing a gender analysis on program activities in Zimbabwe and in Ethiopia, pri prior to that, Tanzania and Zambia. And in all of those cases, we were really fac facilitators of a process to engage local communities in determining what they felt were their assets, where their strengths were, and what kinds of programming would respond to, to those situations. So these are just some ways we can do that. We need to look at monitoring and evaluation. Obviously, the donors are demanding excellence. They're demanding evidence of an impact that we, know we need to be able to show. So those things are all also very important. We use IHD and gender in the various aspects of the program cycle um, from, from the beginning to the end. And in particular, we've been using it very systematically, much more so now, in some of the sectoral work, principally agriculture and health. That's where we found most of it. Um, just to take a quick look at a few examples of, of how, we've, how we've looked at it. Um, these are examples, all of which I've been involved in in the last six months, or approximately six months. And we'll take them one by one. The first one is really, if we were going to take a sector, such as our work in HIV and AIDS, what kinds of things would we, how would that link to, how would the IHD framework link to that work? We'd ask questions such as these about assets. How does HIV and AIDS affect our households and our communities? assets, their capabilities, what they have, the resources they have to do this work. Structures and systems, we need to know where, for example, does the, the critical areas of stigma lie and with whom within those communities. We need to begin to ask very critical questions around that. What are the trends? Is it increasing? Is it, is it on the up, upscale? Is it coming back down? Where, what are the kinds of trends around issues related and the factors that cause them in terms of HIV. And then really, what kind of a strategy do we propose to use in, within this framework to respond to that? So here's an example, what we might do. We might have an agriculture component that helps families, in this case, to diversify. We, that might include uh, some training, in particular, within the ag sector. Um, we might have an education component that will help to make sure that more of the girls in those communities where HIV is prevalent can, are able to stay in school. We'd look at advocacy and work with other NGOs with whom we collaborate in those regions around issues. And some of those, in some cases, for example, in, in Ethiopia today, food aid, handing, being still that relief agency that CRS is so good at, we still need to be doing that in certain contexts. And in the case of HIV, that also, the care and support, the, the need for adequate nutrition for people living with, with uh, HIV. And obviously, the peace building piece. So those are just examples of how you would put together a holistic approach around a sector, in this case, the health sector. The other area where we've done a lot of work using the HI, HIV, H, I, IHD framework is in the area of analysis of livelihoods. And that has focused principally in the agricultural sector, but also we are looking at it much broader now in terms of some of the microfinance work that's being done, the, the health issues, um, among, among others. So there again, we can look at assets, we can look at what the vulnerabilities are in particular, because that's part of that framework, and then to really 
see what structures and systems need to be addressed if we are going to move into to, to concretely coming up with solutions or coming up with strategies th that work. So, so really, I think for CRS, this is really what the approach we've used. We see these beneficiaries, call them that, although we're often not liking to talk about targeted quotes populations, but basically we see them as having, we, we know that there's a great deal of work to be done in terms of their capacity to be able to be managers of those complex assets that exist in their communities. We recognize the diversity of all of those pieces to that puzzle, and we really spend a great deal of time focusing on the strengths and the innovations that need to happen in order to make our programs be better. And basically what we've seen, and it's quite fascinating when you're out in the field walking around with people and you're asking key questions, and people say to you, thank you for asking about me and about my life and my family and my community in ways that many people have not had that opportunity before. That's empowering. And that's, in fact, what happens with, I think, the CRS, CRS approach using the IHD and gender framework. Um, a quick example of some recent work we just did in Zimbabwe. Um, we ha were asked to do an agriculture, nutrition, and gender assessment in preparation for two new big proposals, one a Food for Peace proposal and the um, British government DFID proposal on looking for alternative livelihoods in very um, drought-stricken regions of southern Africa. And so basically, what did, we, what did we need to do? We needed first and foremost to ensure that the voices of those individuals in those contexts were heard and that we weren't going to be designing something sitting behind a desk here in Baltimore or, or somewhere else, but we were in fact listening to the voice of those communities. We, that process also strengthened the, the capacity of our local staff and our partners to be able to do that better. And that was part of the strategy, was to, to make sure that we were actually working with those individuals who will be the implementers of the programming that, that we end up doing. We used some very interesting, and you'll see in a minute, some examples. This, uh, these are two women in Zimbabwe who are, sh are demonstrating to the rest of the community, they mapped out the resources and the assets of that community. And in this particular case, you can't see it very well, but there were six communities. And they struggled in the beginning to say, well, the water belongs to me. The, the borehole over here is yours. The dam, the river, the, uh, the school, et cetera, et cetera. And they began to really understand that they had so many assets within their community, but they hadn't seen it in that perspective. And so it was a fascinating opportunity to bring that community together and to recognize the, the tremendous amount of talent and skills and needs that they had. So basically, um, CRS really has been able to do this in multiple frameworks. This particular one, in the case of Haiti and Guatemala, we were able to, to use it to strengthen our programmatic approach uh, responding to the situation of the need for food security um, and food sovereignty in countries like Haiti post-earthquake and Guatemala in regions where the highest uh, levels of malnutrition exist in the Americas. So those were examples, too, of where we've had to do it. In Tanzania, we did something very different. We did a, what's called a barrier analysis, which took the IHD framework and set up a system of looking at legal, political, social, economic barriers to the engagement of vulnerable people, in this particular case related to a value chain on rice. And we analyzed it using IHD and using a gender lens to see, in fact, what were the constraints that we needed to make sure we were going to put into our programming that would deal with women's role in the household, access and control of resources, decision making, things that are really critical to that piece of of the pie. Um, Malawi, um, there again, we actually focused on CRS's need to put forward an assessment that would be linked to the strategic program plan that CRS does every year in each country program. And there again, um, a, a 
we used some of those same tools and strategies, and it was really an opportunity for our staff and our partners to build that capacity that they needed to, throughout that assessment process and beyond, because they will be the implementers. Um, interesting, the, the last example that I wanted to give you is just to take a, take a look for a minute at Ethiopia. We had a, a situation recently where um, some, some actual university professor um, friends of yours, I'm sure, visited and had gone back numerous times and began to see and understand the context where on certain levels, the economic, the, the, um, the, there's more roads, the Chinese are there putting in their, their new roads, there's all kinds of changes taking place on one level. And then they looked a little deeper and said, you know, what we really see here is that we, the, the adolescent girls in these communities, of which there are many, are not being served. And what, what is it that we can do? What the, how can CRS get to the point of the core issues of gender inequities? And how can the IHD framework help us move in that direction? So basically, these are just some examples of things that, ha that happen when you're in that context. Um, the donor has required that we do this extensive gender analysis within that context. We're using the IHD framework to do that. We're taking each step of that framework and filling it in, in terms of what's going on in the country program, in, in all the programs across the board, not just one or two, but everything that CRS e Ethiopia is doing. And we're going to build in that aspect of looking at adolescent girls. Um, we're looking at how the M&E plan will fit into that process. And, and also just issues of hidden poverty. Today, what the terminology out there is time poverty. Um, not just income poverty, but time poverty. What does that mean? The, the, the labor intensive, intensity of women, of young girls, carrying water, looking for firewood, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all very concrete things now that we need to begin to look at. And we look at barriers. What are the barriers? And then we build our programming around those barriers. So that's basically just some quick examples of, of working with communities to do this. We don't sit and design these programs in isolation. And the beauty of, and the joy of it really has been the opportunity to use very participatory tools and strategies to make this kind of a, of a program work. That's it. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Trish.